Hello, everybody. Hello. Glad you made it in. Uh, hope you got yourself a sandwich, and we are all fortified for some very rich food uh, that we will experience uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm glad we are all in. We had foolishly thought we would start this thing at 12:30. It is now, as you've noticed, one o'clock. So we are going to uh, plan to go one to 2:30 understanding that there may be people who will need uh, grab other plans that need to get their best seat for the football game this evening. <laughs> Whatever foolishness you have in mind. So, uh, 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 but we'll, we'll get our full hour and a half of time together. This, uh, this gathering is, is one of our Price Lectures, uh, uh, which uh, uh, Bill Rich is going to step up to tell you a little bit about the Price Lectures. So, um, I should say, we're going to begin with a word from our sponsor, um, which is the Price Lectures, and Bill's going to come explain how, how all this has come about and what it means before we get started. Thank you, Sam. Um, some of you know this story, but uh, it's always an interesting story to hear. Uh, there was a member of this parish and a vestry person here in the 18th century named William Price, who, out of the generosity of his um, estate, left money to this parish to establish a lecture series humbly named in his own honor. Thus, <laughs> <laughs> the Price Lecture Series. Um, I like to say about him that his generosity was intended to beget further generosity, uh, because what he stipulated um, in his will was that this lecture was to be open to the public, and that there was to be a free will offering that would not come to Trinity Church. Uh, originally, the, the collection was to be divided between two other parishes, Old North Church, made famous by the Paul Revere um, uh, Ride, uh, an Episcopal church to this day, and what had originally been an Anglican church, uh, King's Chapel, that became the first Unitarian church uh, in Boston. So, to this day, we collect money according to uh, William Price's will. Um, there's a free will offering basket on the same table where you got your sandwiches. That's, it's not to pay for your sandwich. It's a free will offering, and what is taken in will be divided between those two parishes, um, as Mr. Price uh, intended. The other two things to say is the, this is not the only Price Lecture uh, series uh, for this year. Um, Jim Wallace, uh, the founder of the Sojourners Community, will be with us in March, and Luke Timothy Johnson, one of the leading uh, New Testament scholars, will be with us uh, in, uh, on the last Sunday of April. So, some things to look forward to. I'll just say a word about John Philip Newell, since quite a number of you will have been at one of the other events across this weekend. John Philip Newell is one of the bright shining lights in this moment of huge transformation in Christian faith and religious faith in general. And he's one of the ones who's helping us to begin imagine new ways of experiencing God. He has a book called The Rebirth of God, which is very much about the rebirthing of the sense of the presence of God and where we're finding, beginning to find God and thinking of new ways to live in the presence of God. He has a wonderful contemplative spirit. He's already uh, led us in some very moving opportunities for prayer itself. But best of all, he's just uh, someone who is seeing into the future and beginning to give us some pointers for what Christian faith can become going forward. We've had a lot of his books in the bookstore, a good many of them have sold, but there are still a goodly many left, so I commend his books to you if you want to carry on thinking after this. And I should, should say there's been a lot of muttering around about going to Iona one of these days to get to see him in the real place. And, and uh, John Philip is saying that that's not a crazy idea, that it's possible that we might create a whole pilgrimage to Iona coming in the next year or two. We can all hope and pray for that. Yes. But for now, over to John Philip. Thank you, Sam. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> May I begin with a prayer, a prayer for presence.
in the gift of this day, in the gift of the present moment, in the gift of time and eternity intertwined. Let us be grateful. Let us be attentive. Let us be open to what has never happened before. In the gift of this day, in the gift of the present moment, in the gift of time, and eternity intertwined. Amen. Amen. Well, again, may I say how much I've enjoyed being among you this weekend, even though they've been working me so ruthlessly. <laughs> That's what you do when you're working on the earth. We've been remembering over the weekend the, one of the most cherished images in the Celtic Christian world from which I draw so heavily in my own life and in my teachings. And I see this tradition as uh, a significant resource for this moment in time as we ask in soul-searching ways what, are we, what, what we are being called to be uh, as a Christian household in the world at this moment. How can we be bearers of blessing to be part of this holy work of healing and new beginnings in our world, among us as nations, and for the earth? So we've been remembering one of the most cherished images that has passed down over the centuries in the Celtic world. It is the image or the memory of John the Beloved leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper. And it was said of him in the Celtic world that he therefore heard the heartbeat of God. He became a symbol of the practice of listening. Listening deep within ourselves, listening deep within one another, listening within the body of the earth for the beat of the sacred. Do we know that we are bearers of this unspeakably beautiful presence? And do we know that we can honor that presence in one another and in everything that has being? And do we know that it is this combination, growing in awareness that we are bearers of sacred presence, combined with a faithful commitment to honor that presence in one another, including finding ways of honoring and looking for that presence in those who most threaten us, those who are most different from us, and seeking that presence, to cherish and reverence that presence in the body of the earth and the creatures of the earth, that this combination holds the key to transformation. We've been hearing this weekend, as I was uh, again mentioning this morning, we've been listening to Julian of Norwich, who says so simply, but so radically. She says, we're not just made by God, we are made of God. We're not simply fashioned from afar by a distant creator, but rather we come out of the very essence of God, or as she says, we come out of the womb of the one. Now, what does it mean to say that we are made of God? In part, it is to say that the wisdom of God is deep within us deeper than the ignorance of what we have done. It is to say that the creativity of God, something of the essence of the creativity that is at the heart of the expanding universe, forever finding new form, new expression, something of the essence of that creativity is deep within us, pure gift of God deeper than any barrenness in our lives or relationships, deeper than any apparent dead ending in the world, this capacity that has been placed within us, made of God, to bring into being what has never been before. And above all else, to say that we are made of God is to say, as Julian does, that deep within us are what she calls the love longings of God, the love longings, the yearnings 
for oneness, the holy desire for union. And these are deeper in us than any fear or hatred that holds us in the tragedy of fragmentation and separation that we witness and are part of in our world. So part of what we've been doing this weekend is to ask, well, what would it look like if these true depths are of Godness? What would it look like for these depths to come forth again? Or as Jesus says in his mantra of teaching, we need to be born again. What would it look like for our true depths to come forth into radical new expression? This afternoon, I'd like to do a couple of things. Uh, one is to do a presentation on the major, the two major emphases that we find in the Celtic Christian tradition. Uh, and this is not to suggest we all need to become Celtic Christians. I mean, this is not a Celtic funda <coughs> fundamentalism. This is saying that we, this is a treasure for us to access at this moment in time. So I'd like to look at the two major features of this tradition. And then I'd like to invite us into some meditative practice together, and then some hearing from one another coming out of the meditation experience. So, we are made of God, or what is deepest in us is the image and likeness of God. One of the things that the Celtic tradition very clearly names or recognizes is that although we are made of God, we live in a type of forgetfulness of our deepest identity. One of the great teachers in this tradition, John Scotus Eriugina in the ninth century, said that we suffer from soul forgetfulness. We have forgotten who we are. And the more we forget who we are, and the more we forget the true identity of one another and of everything that has being, the more and more we treat one another as we should not treat one another. The more and more we slip into forgetfulness, the more and more we move into the sort of madness of how we are wronging or exploiting one another as nations, as people. So Christ is spoken of sometimes as our memory. We have forgotten who we are, but Christ is our memory. He comes embodying not a truth that is foreign to us, but rather comes disclosing or manifesting the truth of our deepest identity, that we are made of God, that we come forth from the womb of the Holy. He's spoken of sometimes also as our revelation, this word that comes from the Latin root revelare, which just means to lift the veil. We seen as lifting the veil to show us what is at the heart of our being. Often we see our failings or our sin as what is deepest in us. Many years ago I was leading a retreat uh, in that country to the south of Scotland, the name of which I've just forgotten. <laughs> uh, leading a retreat on the holy island of Lindisfarne. It's a beautiful uh, tidal island. Some of you will have probably been there. So when the tide is out, uh, it's possible to walk over or drive over to the island. When the tide is in, it returns to being an island. It has this lovely sort of rhythm, tidal rhythm. But I was leading a retreat on Lindisfarne and exploring some of these themes around the uh, essential sacredness of what is deepest or first in us. And that night, uh, the night, the first night of the retreat, I had a recurring dream, and it just uh, kept coming at me all night. And in the dream, I was seeing my second daughter, Kirsten, uh, who is a very beautiful young woman, you know, objective father. <laughs> but she's, she's a dancer and has spent five years in India dancing and very beautiful young woman. And, but in the dream, she was being told that she was ugly and that she was stupid and that she knew nothing. And in the dream, when 
this was being said of her, at first she just looked perplexed. Well, why is this being said? But then the more it was said, uh, the more she began to look hurt. And then by the end of the dream, she would, be, she had become inarticulate. Because the definition was finding its way into her. And she was beginning to believe what was being said of her. Now, this is exactly what we have been doing at times in our Christian household, to the extent that the doctrine of original sin has occupied such central place. I mean, we can hardly get through a liturgy, sometimes we can hardly get through a hymn without going on about what shitbags we are. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if we did this in the most important relationships of our life, I mean, if every time I entered the presence of my beloved wife, I felt I had to go on about how horrible I was, I mean, she might like it once. <laughs> But if I did it every time I entered your presence, it would be a pretty sick relationship. And my sense is it would be no more. So what have we been doing um, in giving our children or giving one another the impression that what is deepest in us is opposed to God, instead of what is deepest in us being of God? And we've been up to this in different ways over the centuries. I mean, think about our Church of England, even song, there is no health in us. Think about those words of confessional statement in our Church of Scotland inheritance, in which it is said we are made opposite to all that is good. I sometimes refer to this doctrine as our obsessive compulsive disorder. In that dream of Kirsten being told that she was ugly, that she was stupid, that she knew nothing. As it came to early morning, the night, during the, the night having been a night of that dream coming again and again, but as I approached uh, dawn that day, I came into a type of half wakefulness and I was aware that what I was saying, and I was saying it out loud, I woke up saying her full name. And what I was saying was Kirsten Margaret Iona. Her full name, Kirsten Margaret Iona. And the more I came into consciousness, the more I realized I'm saying her full name because that's who she is. She is Kirsten which means Christ one. Or as Jared Manley Hopkins says, we are what Christ is, immortal diamond. He comes to show us not a foreign truth. He comes to awaken this forgotten truth, this deep truth. She is Christ one. She is Margaret, which means also pearl. She is beyond Christ. And she is Iona, that sacred island on the sea to which people travel for healing and new beginnings. She carries within herself the wellsprings of healing, as do we all. One particular name, but of a universal family. Now, I pay enough attention to my dreams to realize this is not primarily a dream about my daughter. It's a dream about a part within myself, maybe a wounded, uncertain, feminine part of my own death. And many of us know about that haunted place within. It doesn't take us too long in times of failure, in times of confusion or uncertainty. It doesn't take us too long to go to that haunted place in which we think we know nothing, or in which we forget the unspeakable beauty of the one in whose image we're made. 
it doesn't take us too long to start forgetting the shining, as we were saying this morning. I'd like to spend a little bit of time looking at the first historically recorded teacher of significance in this tradition that we refer to as Celtic Christianity. And I should say, of course, that this, this is a modern term, Celtic spirituality or Celtic Christianity. Uh, but we use it to refer to a distinctive stream within Christianity in the earliest, earliest centuries as it emerged and appeared in the Celtic world. <clears throat> so the first significantly recorded teacher within this Celtic stream of Christianity was a monk named Pelagius, P-E-L-A-G-I-U-S. Now my guess is that if you've heard of Pelagius, you will have heard of him in an entirely negative light. He is perhaps the most grossly misrepresented, misunderstood teacher of all time. I know that those of us who studied theology in Edinburgh, generation after generation was required to write an essay comparing Pelagius with St. Augustine of Hippo. And it was known full well in advance who the hero should be and who the villain should be. And we tended to be told that we didn't have any writings from his hand. Um, so all we could depend on were the writings of Augustine, which of course led to a very fair analysis. <laughs> we, tended to be not, we tended not to be told that he was actually one of us. He was a British Celt. And that he wasn't just a sort of exceptional heretic, he was actually teaching what was the norm in the early Celtic Christian world. Well, Pelagius arrived in Rome early in the fourth century, or late, late in the fourth century. And uh, he very quickly attracted negative attention from people like Jerome and St. Augustine. These criticisms focused on three primary areas. One, he was criticized for his hairstyle. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound uh, very profound, but um, he wore what, what was known as the Celtic tonsure, which was long hair, as opposed to the Roman tonsure, which was shaved up on the crown, with the, the, on, on the top of the head, with the crown of hair. Uh, pointing to the crown of thorns. But the Celtic tonsure had been the Druidic tonsure. So Pelagius arrived in Rome, where Christianity had now become religion of empire, and he arrived looking like a pagan. So one of the things that we know from the Celtic Christian tradition is that they had a radical continuity with the pre-Christian wisdom. Columba of Iona, for instance, <laughs> refers to Christ as his druid, a way, of, a way of reverencing the wisdom that came down in the pre-Christian period. And that wisdom from the pre-Christian was seen as sort of almost an Old Testament to Christ. So Christ was seen as fulfilling that nature mysticism as fulfilling a sense of the sacredness of the universe. The second area of criticism of Pelagius <clears throat> focused on him spending so much time with women, teaching them how to read and to interpret the scriptures. Already, by the late fourth century, in imperial Christianity, the place of women had been subordinated. It was seen as unacceptable for women to be taught to read and to interpret the scriptures. And again, Pelagius was simply doing in Rome what was typical of the young Celtic Christian community, where not only the, the feminine was celebrated as sacred, but we have many cases 
of leadership by women like Bridget of Kildare, who headed up double monasteries, monasteries of men and women living in relationship together under the leadership of a woman like Bridget. But the third area of criticism is, criticism is what we tend to hear most about, and that was criticism of him for teaching not only the sacredness of nature, nature as essentially sacred from God, but especially his emphasis on the sacredness of human nature. He said that when we look into the face of a newborn child, we're looking into the face of God, freshly born among us. I regard the births of my four children as the most sacred <coughs> moments in my life. And I must share what happened a week ago today. I held my first grandchild. <laughs> And when I looked into Ember's eyes, uh, it was like heaven was looking at me. She just calmly looked at me. And I felt I was holding this new expression of God in our midst. And I could smell in her skin something of the freshness of heaven. Now, which one of us is prepared to say about this newborn child that we hold in our arms that this child is essentially opposed to God? I'm not prepared to say that about my children, my grandchildren, any child. Often when I'm sharing Pelagius' teaching, teachings with groups, Parents will come up to me afterwards, especially women, but men and women, and they will say things like, you know, I never believed that my child was essentially opposed to God. That's not why I brought my child for baptism. I brought my child to be baptized to give thanks for this sacred gift and to celebrate that this child has somehow come through me but this child is from deeper than me. This child has come from the one. I was giving talks in Lynchburg, in a church in Lynchburg, Virginia, a number of years ago. Not, not that church in Lynchburg, Virginia. <laughs> another church. And um, at the end of uh, my talk, a woman in her 80s came up the central aisle very purposefully with a copy of my listening for the heartbeat of God in her hands. And she was coming up so purposefully uh, that the naughty boy in me thought, I think she's going to hit me over the ass. <laughs> and uh, she got up and I was wrong. She wasn't going to. She, she said, I want to show you what I wrote in, in the cover of this book when I read it. And she opened it up to me. And she had written, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I so often wish I had asked her for that copy, <laughs> because I think that's how we respond when we hear ancient truth that has somehow either been forgotten or has been obscured. When we hear it, something deep within us says, yes, I knew that. And I think this is one of the things we've known in holding the newborn child. Despite what our inherited doctrine has to say about what is deepest in human nature. Now this is not to be naive about our capacity, our horrendous capacity for falseness and for destructiveness towards one another that one of the things the Celtic tradition is forever inviting us to remember is that deeper still is the beauty and the sacredness. And that what we're, we're being called to do in our own lives and in one another's lives is to liberate what is already there. It's not about placing within 
ourselves or one another, something that is opposed to what is deepest. This ninth century teacher, John Scottus Eriugina, he puts it so succinctly when he says, nature is the gift of being. <coughs> and that is a sacred gift, the sacredness at the heart of nature and at the heart of our nature. So nature is the gift of being, he says. Grace is the gift of well-being. So grace is not seen as opposed to nature, but rather is given that our true nature may come forth again, may be born again. Grace is given not that we might become something other than ourselves, but that we might become truly ourselves. Grace is not given that we might become something other than natural or more than natural, but that we might become truly natural, made of God. Or as that great um, American theologian Woody Allen put it, he says, my only regret in life is that I'm not somebody else. <laughs> uh, typically, um, wonderfully uh, funny of Woody Allen, but it, you know, what he's pointing to is a tragedy as well, isn't it? This tragedy in so much of our culture, and it's infected our religious inheritance at times, this notion that we need to become something other than what is deepest within us. So much more could be said about Pelagius, but I think it's, it, it's worth saying before we leave um, Pelagius that he was, uh, first of all, condemned by the empire on a charge of disturbing the peace. What he was teaching was not convenient to empire. Empire doesn't want to hear of the sacredness at the heart of every human being. So he was first of all banned from the Roman Empire. And then only after that did the imperial religion of the day follow suit and excommunicate him. So that's uh, the first major emphasis, the emphasis on the essential sacredness of the human soul. The second emphasis that I'd like to point to uh, is, is directly related to that, but uh, it, it is worth um, highlighting it as a sort of distinct emphasis that we hear again and again and again. And that is not only the essential sacredness of the human soul, but the essential sacredness of everything that has come into being. The whole universe is seen as, ha as having come forth from the womb of the one. And deep within, everything that has come into being is the longing for relationship. made of God, therefore carrying within ourselves this yearning that everything should move in harmony, in relationship. During our years on Iona, and um, I don't know if I've said that uh, Ali and I spent four years at the Abbey on Iona, uh, leading the community uh, at the Abbey. These were extraordinary uh, years uh, such so formative for us. During the time on Iona, and, and we had, uh, at that stage, we had three of our four children with us, and uh, our three children formed one quarter of the school population. <laughs> <laughs> we also had a, a, a dog um, with us over those years. He was born on Iona, uh, a border collie. And we called him Joe, which in Gaelic is spark of life. And uh, within all things is this desire for oneness, although it can so often be deeply buried within us, or deeply infected or distorted. But this desire for oneness is something that 
we see very immediately in a border collie. <laughs> I mean, Joe the dog, he lived for pilgrimage day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I would come down from the bedroom on a Wednesday morning, um, even before I picked up the staff uh, that um, would be symbolically used to leave the pilgrimage, he was excited. He, he knew it was Wednesday, because on Wednesday, he got to round up sometimes over a hundred pilgrims all day. And, uh, you know, I never did teach him to nip at the heels of, of slow pilgrims. I, I, was, I was much more generous in those days than that. But, I mean, he, we would get out to the western side of the island where the heather is a bit thicker underfoot. And he would be circling us, looking almost berserk <laughs> with ecstasy. And, you know, when I think of happiness or true ecstasy, I often think of Joe rounding us up. Because he was living according to his deepest instinct, this longing for oneness, or the, what Julian calls this love longing, this desire within everything to move in relationship. And in the afternoons on pilgrimage, we go into silence as we approach the hermit's cell, a place of um, solitude within the Celtic monastic uh, life of Columba in the following centuries. And Joe would become especially intent on his work during the silence. It was as if he was responding to the silence. And when border collies get most intent on their work, they get closer and closer to the ground. Mm -hmm. And he was circling us. And we, when we get to the hermit's cell, we would sit in a circle on the edge of the ruins. And Joe would enter the center of the circle and lie down and go to sleep. <laughs> and as someone who knows about border collies said to me after they heard this story, they said, well, if, of course he went to sleep. His work was done. He had you in a circle. <laughs> what has happened to this sacred instinct for unity, for oneness? When we left Iona as a family to move to the city of Edinburgh, we had a difficult decision to make about Joe, because he had never been off the island. And the question was, should he stay on the island or should he come with us to the city? And in the end, we decided he was even more family-related than place-related. So he came with us to the city, although there were some pretty absurd moments in the city <laughs> when he tried to round up city buses and <laughs> anything moving. He wanted to bring it back into relationships. <laughs> But after some years in the city, he uh, was no longer able to exercise his instinct. He developed cancer. I think if we were to go around this room, we would hear stories of just how sensitive the creatures are. And to my mind, there is no coincidence about the fact that Joe developed cancer in the year after our eldest son became mentally ill. Those of you who have mental illness in your family or have come close to the world of mental illness will know just how staggering it can be. And we were truly falling apart as a family. And this dog who lived for oneness was somehow bearing that pain, somehow taking it into himself. And there came a day when he could no longer climb the stairs to the family flat, and I was carrying him. And he, was, he looked so sad, and I realized I can't ask him to stay anymore. So I set a, I made an appointment with the vet and I invited the entire family in for his last moment, but in fact the only one who chose to come was our youngest son, Cameron. And he was at that stage just six. 
and we <coughs> placed Jill up on the vet's table in the surgery and um, she explained to us that she was going to give Jill an injection and after the injection, 20 seconds after the injection, Jill would take a deep breath and that would be his last breath. And one little Cameron, whose head was uh, the same height as the table where Jill was, um, had been placed, when Cameron heard that Joe was going to take his last breath, he got as close as possible to listen. A beautiful moment. Often when I think of presence, the practice of presence, I think of that moment. I mean, is there something more sacred that we can offer one another than presence? And presence is not just about to be being present to the glory of life, it is that. It's also being present to the deep agony or the deep pain of life. And the deep pain that is that so many are in the midst of right now. So to bear presence, to carry presence, is about being present to the sacredness of life, but also to this terrible brokenness. After Joe took his last breath, the, the vet said that she was going to leave us for a while and we offered a prayer of thanks for this spark of life and for his peaceful death. And then we were walking home together uh, in silence and, and little Cameron halfway home said to me, I have a sore throat. <laughs> and I said, why, why do you think you have a sore throat, Cameron? And he said, I think it's because I'm wanting to cry. So I said, well, I have a sore throat as well. And we walked home, and there was the rest of the family waiting for us. And we had a Joe wake. And we laughed and we wept about this one that we often refer to as the most faithful member of the family. Because he lived the instinct for oneness. What has happened to this instinct? It is deep within us. And how do we as a Christian household at this moment in time serve this sacred instinct? So that we can actually be part of leading the consciousness in our world, this growing consciousness of the interrelatedness of all things. And we bring some unique treasure, some great treasure from within our Christian household to serve this moment in time. These are the two emphases that I see as essential to our inheritance through the Celtic stream. Sacredness deep within the human soul and the sacredness deep within all things and this love longing or yearning for oneness that has been woven into the fabric of the universe in which we are being called to serve or to come back into relationship with. Before we do some hearing from one another, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to suggest uh, that in our hearing, we, we uh, after some time of meditative practice, which I'll briefly explain, but after that, that we do some hearing from one another, in, just in clusters of two or three, we just turn to a person next to us, or maybe two, to share anything that's been stirring within us in this session. And it may be something that's calling our attention during the, during the meditative practice. And then after we've done that for a few minutes, then we'll come back into the full group, an opportunity for you to share anything that you'd like to by way of observation or by way of question or something you'd like to share. But first of all, I invite us into a very simple chant, and we have uh, a recorded chant. Uh, these chants come from um, a CD called The Chanting for Peace, which I created with some Scottish uh, musician friends. And in these chants, we uh, use words from the Quran words from the Hebrew scriptures, and words from the teachings of Jesus to pray especially for peace. And the words that um, we'll be using in this chant this afternoon come from the Quran, 
and the words are, in English, uh, the words are, God invites us to the home of peace. God invites us to the home of peace. So as soon as you become familiar with the chant, I encourage you to sing it, uh, sing along with it. And uh, then there's some instrumental um, uh, portions to the chant, and, and at, at those instrumental interludes, we can just listen to the chant and allow the, the words to continue to silently resonate within us. And then when the lyrics come back in, join, feel free to join the chant again. Many of you will be familiar with meditative practice that, that employs this ancient way of focusing, which is sometimes referred to as mantric repetition, or uh, allowing a set of words to be like a mantra that we repeat again and again. These are designed to serve our desire to be more deeply attentive. Because you know what the mind is like. I mean, the mind can swing all, all over the place. Uh, so when, when our mind begins to leap forward, backwards, somersaults, um, don't get cross with your mind. That's just what it does. Um, and in meditative practice, we're just moving to a deeper way of knowing. So when your mind begins to be distracted, taking you all over the place, just return to the words. God invites us to the home of peace as a way of being more deeply present and more deeply attentive. And then after the chant, there will be a few minutes of silence. And during that time, I invite us not, not so much to think about these words or to think about the themes of the session, but just pay attention. What is it that's trying to come up from within the unconscious? What is calling our attention? What is our soul inviting us to be more aware of? And just take note of, of what's stirring within you. Does that seem clear enough? So we have the chant, and it runs for about five minutes. After the chant, we'll have a couple of minutes of silence, just to pay attention to what is stirring. And then I'll invite us uh, to do some sharing in small groups. So the words again of the chant, God invites us to the home of peace. And you'll hear an Arabic descant running through it. The words you'll be hearing are Ya Salam, God, the source of peace.
So for a few minutes now, let's in groups of two or three, just turning to someone next to you or maybe two others, share anything at all that's been calling your inner attention, maybe during the time of meditation especially, but anything at all from the afternoon session so far that's been sort of beckoning your attention. And we'll do some sharing uh, for just a few minutes in those small groups. And if you could keep half an eye out here while you're sharing, and when you see me raise my hand, if you could raise your hand and bring to a close what you're sharing, then we can move back into the full group. And that will be an opportunity to bring anything at all that you'd like to to the whole group. It can be a question, but it doesn't need to be that. It may just be an observation or a sharing that you'd like to bring. Okay, so for a couple of minutes in small groups, first of all. Share anything that you'd like with the entire group. Uh, anything you'd like to share uh, can be an observation. Uh, it can be a question. It needn't be that. And Bill is going to do a, a sort of wand wandering. <laughs> is it the one mic we have, or do we have it's just one? Of okay, so Bill's exercise here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. Bill, there's a question right here come. just by, by the door. Remember, man, that you are not dust, and not unto dust shall you return. <laughs> Heresy. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, uh, it depends how we see dust, I think. <laughs> yeah, so what we're talking about is stardust. Maybe, maybe. And, uh, you know, given the, given the, I think one of the exciting aspects of this moment in time is, is the convergence of so much uh, new science uh, and so much ancient wisdom. And uh, so we one of the things that we, we sort of glimpse um, pretty clearly in the Celtic tradition is an understanding of matter that, is, that, is not, that doesn't represent a lot of the dualism that has so characterized a lot of our Western um, science uh, in the past and so much of our religious philosophical perspective that makes such a, a, a separation between spirit and matter. So um, I, uh, I, I think it's, it's important to remember that we are dust, uh, as long as we don't put down dust too much. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's matter. And uh, as my, my teacher, uh, George McLeod, the founder of the modern day Iona community, used to love to say, uh, uh, he would say, matter matters. Because at the heart of the material is the spiritual. And uh, so, let's be creative about uh, how we see dust. It, you know, it, it's uh, infused with light energy, and uh, and I think that what this tradition is seeing is is that light, the divine energy of light, is deep within all matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, feel free to, to come up here as well. There's some seats. Uh, there's some seats up here, but I'll try to turn up the volume a bit. My wife and I are not part of the Trinity household, but we've been able to be guests here for this weekend, and it's been an incredibly rich and nourishing time, and we thank you for that. 
as we prepared for morning worship this morning, I was sitting in the church looking through the leaflet, and we were kind of wondering if there were going to be Celtic elements incorporated in this morning's worship. And so I noticed the Eucharistic prayer says Iona communion prayer, and we thought, oh, that, that's good. And as we worked our way through the prayer, as Sam was praying the prayer, we came up to this line and it said, we are not fit to gather up the crumbs from under your table. And Sam skipped that line. <laughs> I felt a huge burden lifted. <laughs> and, and the thing that the church has done over the years in varying degrees is to remind us and to tell us we are not fit, we are not worthy. And so I, I was wondering, why was that line there? How, how, why is that there? Could you maybe just speak to that? Thank you. <laughs> I think um, it, it, it certainly doesn't appear in the liturgies that I wrote for the <laughs> But, you know, it's, that's a place of uh, creative tension as well, like every other community. Um, but uh, I think one of, one of the things I would want to emphasize, and I, I really welcome your observation, and uh, um, let's follow Sam on, on this one. <laughs> One of the things to note about the Celtic tradition is that it is a, a robustly penitential tradition. So to, uh, to say that the, the doctrine of original sin should not be our starting point, to say that that is not the reference point for understanding what is deepest within us and deepest within one another, there is this sort of robust practice of of repentance in, in the Celtic world. Uh, and, uh, and I think that that, that is so essential. Uh, it's interesting looking at the debate, the historical debate between Pelagius and Augustine, because uh, primarily I think what we see in Pelagius in his writings is a very strong pastoral heart. Uh, and his concern is that if, if uh, uh, as as I was trying to share uh, in my dream about my daughter Kristen, you know, if, if we tell a child that, that they're ignorant or that they're stupid or that they're not beautiful, uh, the, the child will internalize that. And, and we've done quite a bit of internalizing that. So it's, it's a very dangerous uh, uh, doctrine, the doctrine of original sin, to the extent that it's been used that way uh, because it is disabled. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let's, let's be uh, quite emphatic and quite clear about the importance of naming failure, naming falseness, confessing wrong as a, as a way of moving back into relationship with what is deepest. Uh, and I, my feeling about those words, we are not worthy to receive, I don't think that they should, they should appear in our household's liturgy. I would like to um, to have a sort of exorcism uh, <laughs> from within our household, because I think those words have t have toppled in the sort of disabling uh, direction. But let's make sure that we we uh, hold some very robust practices about confession and not shy away from the uh, strength of naming uh, the falseness that we are capable of and the falseness falseness that we have condoned or been part of. Um, but Pelagius, I think what we see in Pelagius is this pastoral instinct for nurturing what is deepest in, in his people in order to be able to have the strength to act confessionally so that it, it's not a demeaning of itself, it's not a putting down, but rather it is showing us the way of, of liberation that our foundations are sacred within us are these, this strength uh, for new beginnings. And, and this is pure gift that those strengths are within us. Uh, but we need to do this uh, faithful practice 
of, of naming when we, when we have been false to one another or to ourselves. Uh, up here, Bill. We'll come to you. Thank you. I, I just want to uh, express how moving I thought it was, the description of the collie dog in the center of, of the people and how he had gathered everyone there. It was just a very um, profound moment. Um, and I also wanted to share that uh, one of my most stirring moments ever in church was um, being in a chapel outside Edinburgh and having a cat walk into the, um, into the sanctuary and, and kind of circle around and then come and sit in my chair. And it was just one of the most interesting encounters I've had in church. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. And um, some of you, I'm, I'm sure, have been at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City on St. Francis Sunday, and uh, that in my, uh, I had I had heard about that um, service uh, before the the opportunity I had to be there on on St. Francis Sunday, and that moment in the liturgy when the when the uh, west doors open and in came the procession of the creatures and the. Um, the Sunday I, I was there, it was a camel at the beginning of the procession. <laughs> and, um, and when the creatures came in, there was this, uh, uh, almost, our, you know, my breath was taken away. Uh, and it felt so, so profoundly right that the creatures should be in the sacred space. And uh, the procession happens in silence, in in order not to startle them, but also out of a reverence for them, say, you know, and it, um, so that I, I think both the, the experiences we sometimes have of worshipping in the natural context, and this is one of the interesting things to note about the Celtic Christian uh, historical uh, pattern and, and inheritance, it wasn't until after the Synod of Whitby when the imperial mission sort of imposed its will on the Celtic world and, and forced uniformity to the imperial Christian pattern. It wasn't until then that um, the, the British Celtic church design became four, four walls. Before that, the pattern was worship outside. And uh, when, when we do have these experiences of coming back into relationship, um, these can be very, merit, very moving moments. And I think that they're encouraging us to pay attention to how we, are, how we be, can be creative about our worship at this moment in time. And we, we love our four-walled gatherings, and we love the sense of community and reverence and prayer that has been offered there. How can we in our language and in our symbolism and in our teachings um, keep reminding ourselves that, that this worship is something that, that we're being invited to do with the, uh, with the creatures and with the, the great cathedral of earth, sea and sky. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us over these days. Um, I, for some time, have just held this vision that somehow um, we would learn how to get to that place inside ourselves that holds the wisdom, that holds the sacred, so that in the workplace, as well as in the church place, we can all relate to each other and um, bring about change, solve problems, do the work of the world from that place. So I have two questions. One is, uh, what are ways that you've seen perhaps that other church communities have started to, to work with this? What kind of practices, what kind of um, things have they done to introduce and deepen these experiences? And the second is, have you seen how this has been brought out into the marketplace um, as a way of relationship in solving problems and creativity. Mm. Thank you. I think um, 
one of the, the patterns that we see extremely early on in the Celtic Christian stream. And we see it, for instance, very clearly in, in Pelagius and in his practice and his teachings, is the, a significant place being given to, to meditative prayer um, and to the, the discipline of, of prayerful inner attentiveness. And uh, not only is that, is that very clear that this, this is the well to which we are each being invited to return to, um, to drink from that inner well uh, that is within each of us. Not in an individualistic way, not, not to say, you know, I'll, I'll delve into my well and you delve into yours and believe whatever you want. It's more this belief that that well uh, is a shared place uh, at the heart of all of us. But we all do, in, in Pelagius' teaching, it's very clear that we all have responsibility to, to delve into that well, to draw from that living well of truth. 